So there's a misconception that if you're single, you are incomplete, perhaps damaged, salvaged, and you won't be happy until you find your one. And that is not true. That is bullshit. It is a message that has been fed to us by media and advertising. The truth is, when you're single, you have the richest soil for growth. That's why I created this podcast. And unlike other podcasts, this one is host-driven, not guest-driven. That means I will be rotating health and wellness experts three times a week to give you the giant box of wellness crayons, not just the primary colors, so you can start building a meaningful life. It's time to give singlehood a cape. So the host of today's episode, I met through Vanessa, my partner, and uh, she's disclosed this on her podcast and social media, so I will as well. These were the catalysts in her life early years. So Ashley was her therapist, and she also did sessions with Ashley's husband, Lair. So I thought it was interesting to bring them on as host slash contributors because uh, she they were just such a powerful part of Vanessa's story. and. I know they will be for you, for you as well. Okay, Laird Torrent is the author of the book, The Practice of Love, Break Old Patterns, Rebuild Trust, and Create a Connection That Last. He is a leading marriage family therapist and a mindfulness-based relationship therapist. A daily OM bestselling author and a contributing columnist at Inc.com. He has been resourced and interviewed by such notable news outlets and publications as NPR, Rolling Stone, The New York Times, and a host of podcasts and radio shows. He is the co-host of the Not Your Mama's Therapy podcast and can be found on Instagram at Lair Torrent, T-O-R-R-E-N-T, Holistic Therapist. And his wife, Ashley Torrent, is a psycho-spiritual therapist, intuitive medium, and spiritual teacher. She sees both individual and couples, offers intuitive readings, teaches classes in spiritual mediumship, and is a co-host of the Butterfly Effect podcast. I'm sorry, the Blue Butterfly Effect podcast, which aims to ground spirituality and explore personal transformation. Ashley believes that as spiritual beings, we are all mediums, channels, and energy healers, but have forgotten our true nature and how to use these innate gifts. She also believes Based on her personal experience as a complex trauma survivor and practitioner, practitioner, that true healing occurs when we, we weave together psychological understanding and spiritual practice. She can be found on Instagram at Ashley Torrent, T-O-R-R-E-N-T 29. I hope you enjoyed this episode with Lair and Ashley. Hello and welcome everyone to the Single on Purpose podcast. Today... Today, the Single on Purpose podcast has been taken over by the Practice of Love podcast with yours truly, Lair Lair Torrent. I am a licensed marriage and family therapist, and I'm joined, as always, with my partner in crime, my life partner, my wife, my better half, Ashley Torrent, who is also a therapist as well as an intuitive medium. And today, what are we talking about today, Ash? Oh, we fight. How we, but, me and you. Me and you. Let's see how it goes. <laughs> <laughs> I have to admit, it's, yeah, it feels a little, uh, you know, a little spicy. We can get, get near that, the, you know, how's this going to go? Is, are we going to be able to uh, keep it together? Can you keep it, can you keep it together? Maybe not. <laughs> yeah, who's the fiery one of the two? <laughs> That's, I'm not sure we know. I'm not sure we actually know that. I think everyone thinks you have the angel wings, and of course you do. But no, more than likely, I'm probably the one who's a little bit more fiery. Uh, but they didn't call you little TNT for all those years for no reason. Um, no. We all have that side of ourselves that can come out, especially when our buttons are pushed. And today we want to talk about how we fight and hopefully give some tips and pointers and have some discussions about our experiences and what we think helps us fight better because look, I don't know about you. Actually, I do know about you that when a couple comes in and tells me that they don't fight, that they never fight, I'm like, Oh man, that's a problem. That's a powder keg ready to, to, to boil over. Um, actually, I don't think powder kegs boil over, but aside from that, you know what I mean? Oh, I know. I'll I remember did it. that one. I, yeah. I gotta remember that you one. You did it. 
<laughs> you uh, used the wrong word. <laughs> yeah, well, I always make fun of her for messing up little colloquialisms. She's famous for saying that she would sure like to be a bump on a wall in that room um, or a fly on a log. And yeah, right. So oh, you get the picture. You're on the lamb when she's sick. She's not running from anything. She's just sick. She's on the lamb. But today we're going to talk about how we fight. And, you know, since this is the single on purpose podcast, this is not just it's not necessarily for um, romantic relationships. It's how you fight in any relationship, really, whether it's a familial relationship, whether it's with colleagues, friends, um, or you're just single right now. And, you know, you're going to be in a relationship at some point and you want to kind of hone those skills because our friend, Mr. John Gottman, has said that. Uh, how we fight really does predetermine how well the relationship is going to go. And if you don't fight well, it's pretty much uh, the death knell for any relationship. If you don't fight well, and he outlines, everyone's heard of the four horsemen of the apocalypse, criticism, contempt, defensiveness, and stonewalling, all of those. Uh, if you do any of those in concert with 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 another one in, in that grouping, then he can predict between, I think he said 94% uh, predictability that, uh, your, your, your relationship is not going to make it now. I don't know if that's actually true, but I think by and large, it's true. If you don't fight well, um, it's, it's going to be, uh, a, a, a rough road, no matter what relationship you're in. Any thoughts on that? Yeah. Because if you're not fighting <clears throat> well, you're saying and doing things during those fights that can't be taken back. You're creating wounds that create scars and create scar tissue. Um, you know, fight, you don't want to hurt the person you love, you know, and ultimately, but when people get fired up, mm, they do want like to hurt. Right. That's their intention. <laughs> they want to yeah. hurt so bad and they forget that they love this person. Well, and I think maybe less than, than hurt, there is, there are parts of us that are designed to create distance. Right. And, and so one of the best ways to create that distance, to give ourselves some space to, do whatever it is we need to do, take a breath, regroup. Sometimes it's to be and to do and say things that um, we have to apologize for later. But something you just said kind of piques my interest, which is you, <clears throat> I don't know if you said you can't take it back. Um, mm -hmm. I like to say there are just sometimes you can say things that can't be unheard. No. Right? No. And for me and for us over the course of the twenty two years we've been together now. Is it 22, 21, 22? Yeah. Um, 21. I think, I think we've been really careful uh, about how we've set the boundary markers as it were. Um, I would, I know I was really keen early on um, in our, when we were just dating to, you know, probably have preemptive conversations that may have been, you know, may have seemed a little, might've been a little too early for some people, but you and I started talking about how we fought or how we fight early. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember that was a terrible fighter. <clears throat> you were not good. No, I was not good. And we talked a little bit about this in the previous podcast we did here about trauma. Um, I couldn't fight in my house. There was no room for anger or expression. I think that's common for a lot of people. I don't think there's been a lot of kids, hopefully this generation or these generations that are up and coming are allowed to have their feelings and allowed to be angry, allowed to say no. But when you grow up in a house where you can't do those things mm -hmm. and fighting my, with my mother was actually dangerous. So um, I didn't know how to do it. And um, we talked about like being in relationship to you, how I think I felt safe mm -hmm. enough to fight with you. Lucky me. <laughs> so lucky you felt safe enough to do and say those terrible things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was pretty awful because I, I would get into blackout rage, like trauma rage and um, say terrible <clears throat> things. Um, and, and also I didn't I, I did the threats, you know, well, maybe we shouldn't be together. And, mm -hmm. you know, I can't even remember at this point what I probably said, but um you know, wanting to get a reaction, you know, wanting, um, wanting to be, I think the, in the power, I think there's a power dynamic that happens in fights and you want to stay in the power position. Um, and again, like you said earlier, not everyone always wants to hurt, but I think a lot of people are uncomfortable being, not being in the power position and wanting to, um, defend their position. And I was definitely doing that. 
conversely, I find couples who come in to see me, are, they will fight for the victim position too, because the victim position is often safer. You hurt me way more than I've hurt you. And so I find that people. Mm-hmm. Well, I think that's a power position. <clears throat> it is a power position. I think you're right. Yeah. 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 Like if um, you did me wrong, then I'm, you know, I'm more in that power position, if that makes sense. Not the dominant fighter as much as the one not holding all the responsibility. That's right. Well, and I, it brings me back to, and I, and I covered, I covered it in the book, the practice of love, um, where I tell the story of this sort of seminal moment in our fighting. And, and it it was a moment, um, when we had yet again, woken up after we were, this is back in our dating years, it's in New York city. And we had had a terrible fight. I would say it, it was tequila filled for sure. Uh, late into the night, terrible fight that we had in my apartment. We woke up the next morning, obviously cooler heads had prevailed. And I remember thinking, I never want to do this to you again. I never want to talk to you. I think, I think I called you some names and probably got some called back at me. And I just remember thinking like, this oh, is yeah, not going. Yeah. names this called. Is, yeah. No. I don't even remember because I don't remember any of those terrible things. Um, I, I blank those out. <clears throat> but I remember waking up that day and thinking, I never want to do that to her again. And we made a pact that morning. We said, we said that morning, like, no matter what happens, no matter how long we're together for, and we didn't at that point really know how long we were going to be together that we would never call each other another name again. Mm -hmm. And I know there are a lot of people out there that go, well, yeah, no, okay. It doesn't really help me because I'm not a name caller. I don't devolve down to that level, but there are a lot of different things that you do when you fight that could be substituted in for name calling. Yeah. For me equal widening the boundary markers to allow things into your fighting, um, that aren't okay. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, like volatility, yelling and screaming, breaking things. Um, that what we called in the, vi- in the, in the book, the violent leave yeah. is one of them. <clears throat> Excuse me. And for, for those who don't know what that means, the violent leave is something people do pretty regularly. And that is where you see, where you get sick and tired of whatever's going on. You've had too much, uh, and you decide to leave. Now, whether the door is, to the outside and you actually leave the building or it's just to an adjacent room. For me, that, that leave tends to feel violent. Um, especially if your partner or the person you're fighting with has some kind of an abandonment history, because what you're showing them is here's a little taste of what I'm capable of. Yeah. And so that can be something that we want to opt out of our, our, our fighting. Um, you know, the thing you mentioned earlier, like that's it. We shouldn't be together or the, the, you know, for, for those who are married, um, I get this a lot with my couples. It's like, well, we should just get a divorce. And the rule mm-hmm. of thumb I put in there is with them is you're not allowed to say that unless you mean it, unless you call the lawyer and you really mean it, you're actually not allowed mm-hmm. to use that word. Mm-hmm. And so what this does is, um, it starts to bring the boundary markers back in. And that's what we did on that on that faithful morning, on that faithful morning, that day in, in that, um, that, that apartment, because I think what we did is we set the tone and said that there are going to be certain things that are allowed and certain things that are not. We made and a list of roles. Did we? Yeah. I mean, we, and oh we didn't write them down, but it was no name calling, no threats, mm-hmm. you know, no screaming and yelling. You know, we mm-hmm. really, um, we, we made those boundaries and the beautiful thing is we abided by those boundaries all these years later. <laughs> All these years later, we we totally honored those boundaries. And unfortunately I've had, I've suggested to couples, you know, make some rules Mm -hmm. and they'll Mm -hmm. agree to it. And then they break it the next fight. And then, you know, it's Mm -hmm. like, well, we couldn't help it. I lost control. Mm -hmm. You can't lose that much control. You Mm -hmm. have to stay in control. And this is where Mm -hmm. mindfulness comes in. But before we went to that, I wanted to see if you wanted to add anything. Well, just that. You know, we'll get to how we kept the promise because that's not, that's not easy. Like, I'm not shocked that people make the promise and can't keep it. Like that's, that yeah. seems like boilerplate couple stuff. <clears throat> um, but what I, what I, the, the end product for me was a level of reverence for you. 
mm. in our from me in my heart in my mind you live in this place right like in that moment i remember thinking to myself there are people in my life that no matter how angry i was at them i would always speak mindfully that i would be careful with my words that i would think about the end result that i would be full of care or careful as i like to say um with how I treat them, even when I'm upset, hurt, or angry. And I just don't understand how people put their significant partners in, 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 a, in a different category. Like this is a person that perhaps you're going to spend your life with. You're, maybe you're just dating them. Um, uh, maybe you've decided to move in. Maybe you're, 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 you're going to have a family with them. You're going to spend your life. Why wouldn't you choose to put them in that bin of people that you you know, come hell or high water would speak carefully, mindfully with and to. And for me, that bred reverence, right? That you live in this place where I would never, never speak to you that way. I would never call you a name. I would never just walk out of the house and um, not, you know, give you a sense of where I was going or, you know, anything like that. She was angry. Yeah, no. And no, I think we, we did that for each other. I did that for you as well. And for me who, and many people don't have this, you know, my trauma is pretty severe, but you know, I think let's face it, there, there wasn't, especially in our generation that I know of a lot of, um, healthy family dynamics going on. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. and so when you took the initiative and brought that to me, I was like, yes, let's do that. You know, I was pretty, I was pretty open and excited to honoring anything mm -hmm. that was different from where I'd come from. I didn't want a violent, volatile home. I wanted peace and I didn't want to be hurt and I didn't want to hurt you. Um, mm -hmm. You were the most important person in my life at that time. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I wanted to honor and respect that. And you modeled that for me, which was really helpful. Right. Well, and even beyond, if for those people who are saying, well, I don't go to that violent or rageful place. There's that, what Gottman calls stonewalling. Um, mm -hmm. that comes in various forms. You don't have to use those terms if you don't like them. Um, this is where people just shut down and go away or disassociate. Mm -hmm. And that is, a, even if you're standing in the same room with them, mm -hmm. it can still feel like you're not there or that they've been abandoned. Mm -hmm. and well, I'm, I'm, this is, I've been guilty of that. Without even knowing it, shutting down. I am guilty of all of these. <laughs> <laughs> I don't necessarily think you, it's, it's, it's different when, you know, if I think if I'm, if, if I, if I'm onto what you're talking about it, this wasn't because you were upset with me about a particular thing. This is, this, this is another, this is another show um, <laughs> that we're, that we're planning, but yeah. So like, it's the, um, the love embargo is what we're talking mm, okay, about. Okay. Right. Right. And so this is when things go chilly. And so the fight's not hot. The fight's cold. It's just sort of simmering under the surface always. Right. right. That's another form that we let these, these things just percolate. And mm -hmm. so we stew on these, these thoughts and these feelings. And in the book, I talk about the narrative that can be formed. Um, those thoughts that become feelings, those feelings become thoughts. And pretty soon that narrative is, this is just who you are. And if we let that go long enough, it's really hard for me as a therapist to help bring people back from the brink of this is just who you've become. And so the love embargo, we usually think about embargoes as a ban on trade and goods between two countries as an example. But I co-opted the term love embargo because it seemed that's what was happening with couples for me is there was this cold war happening between them where, um, yeah, they weren't necessarily fighting. Like no one was yelling, nothing was broken, but they weren't connecting. And they were both standing on, uh, you know, the other side of their chilly walls saying, I'm happy to do better when you do better. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And, and, and I'm not going to, no, I'm not going to ante up. And so one of the toughest things I face, and I'm sure that you face that too, and your couples work and you can speak for yourself, but is to get those people to ante up once they've been hurt over the course of time again and again and again. Yeah. They often are like, why should I, you know, mm -hmm. I'm done trying. Why should I, you know? And mm -hmm. at that point when you're done trying, then, you know, there can't be any movement. And I think if you're going to be in the relationship, trying a new behavior, um, can be really powerful. 
Um, you know, practicing self-control when you're angry and de-escalating or not escalating and slowing down, it can stop that, um, that dynamic where you're just in that cycle. And you've talked about this a lot with, and this moves more into parts where, um, depending on which part of you is showing up, you know, a lot of couples get stuck in these same cycles, like these defender That's parts right. of self, and they're having the same conversation over and over again. So then they mm -hmm. just get to the point where they're like, I'm done even trying. Well, right. Well, mm -hmm. when you, when you exist in that defender part, that part of you that's designed, as we talked about earlier, to create space and to not connect because it's safer to do that. And over the course of time, you build a narrative that becomes actually my belief about who you are and who you are not. Then we're in real mm -hmm. trouble. That's when we're in real trouble. But um, I'd like to do a little bit of a deeper dive on this, if that's okay. Uh, I'm not necessarily changing course, but I'd like to say that whether we're talking about it as Gottman's Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, or we're talking about the violent leave, the love embargo, the finger pointing, the name call, whatever it is, the Cold War, these are all symptoms, right? These are all symptoms of something else. And this is where I think things get really important. In a little bit, we'll talk about the different practices that we talk about in the book, the practice of love that help you fight better. But until we understand what we're fighting about and for, for real, for me, we're, this isn't really a conversation because it's what Sue Johnson said in her book, Hold Me Tight. She said, therapists and the clients that they serve often are only willing to go to the waterline on this stuff. They're not really oh, willing. Mean, yeah, go, sorry, ahead. go ahead. Not really willing to what? Go ahead. Not really willing to, to dive beneath the surface and look at what's actually here, what's actually mm -hmm. fueling the fights, right? Like, what are these protector parts fighting for? It's not I was what say, we're having for dinner. No, no, right. I was going to say that <clears throat> I have couples that they're so caught up in the details of what mm -hmm. happened. And it's for me sitting there witnessing it. It's the same it's mm -hmm. different details, but the same dynamic over and over again, where and this one feels hurt. This one feels abandoned. Um, and that's what you're saying is like, and I'm, and trying to corral those conversations, mm -hmm. you know, and mm -hmm. get, mm -hmm. and I've tried to say, it's not about the details of this, but I would love to hear the story, but for time, we need to put the details to the side. But see, that's the mark of a seasoned veteran therapist who's been in the seat for a while, because I think you, at least I'll speak for myself on this. When I first started out, I would get caught up in those details. And try to find out, well, you know, we got, we have to figure out who's right and who's wrong here. There's right. obviously a victim. Um, and so I would put my referee shirt on and it would look like a Wimbledon match. My head would be going back and forth and back and forth. And finally I'd be like, I, I realized that I was doing a disservice to my couple staying in those symptomatic aspects of what, what they said to who and when and how. And that's not what I said. That's not my intention. And so if you get caught up either as um, a person in the fight or as a therapist in the details of this. And I know that this is going to rub people the wrong way. How are the details not important? Right. They said they'd be home at eight. They came home at 12. How is it not that not important? So I think we should talk about how, why that's not important, which is to say well, that when we drill down below the waterline, what are we looking for? You're looking to answer. Right. There's some questions that are, that come from our childhood wounds. That's right. You know, That's that right. the, the yeah. details, once you notice the pattern, the details don't matter because it's the same pattern playing out. But at the bottom beneath the waterline is that initial wound that hurt that right. that person is looking for an answer to that question. That's not being met in that fight mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and in that relationship when they're fighting like that. That's right. And, you know, one of the things that sort of got us onto the trail of these pieces of what people are really looking for in relationships and what we're actually fighting for um, in relationships was when I read, uh, Carl Rogers. And for those who don't know who Carl Rogers is Carl Rogers, he sort of turned psychotherapy on its head. Um, he was one of the, he was the first humanistic, uh, therapist, I believe he was the one who sort of spearheaded the humanistic movement that moved away from essentially psychoanalysis and sort of made it, made emotionality important. And, um, looked at, he said, he said, when you're whatever, when a client comes to the door, they are looking for unconditional positive regard from your therapist because that's the thing they didn't get. And so for me, I was like, well, what the hell is that? Right. Cause it's going to probably be different for everybody. Right. And how does it show up in the room? And, and so I started watching myself listening to you because I'm, you know, um, I'm privileged to 
a, a large amount of your process around your childhood wounding. And then I looked at my couples and I was able to distill it down to four things. We are asking in a relationship and in every fight, I don't care if we're fighting over where, what we're having for dinner or how we're parenting, parenting the kids or why the sex is bad. We're fighting to know whether I am, I need to know that I'm loved, that I'm safe, that I'm enough and that I matter. Am I loved? Am I safe? Am I enough? And do I matter? What are your thoughts on that? Well, and I think that they are all important, but I think we each have one. When you distill it down, I think we each have one that's very, um, that's just this primal wound. Like for me, mine is, am I safe? You can tell me you love me all day and that's awesome and wonderful. You can tell me that I matter. You can make me feel good enough, all those things. Mm -hmm. But with my history, Mm -hmm. you could, you know, not anymore, but with my history, anyone can do all those things and then turn into a monster at any point. So I was Mm -hmm. constantly looking for safety and constancy and consistency within our relationship. And And by you demonstrating those things, I felt safe. Yeah. But look, I couldn't, I, I unwittingly did some, some of that, that day on that, in that, in, in that apartment when we reset the boundary markers, because I was like, okay, mm-hmm. I'm not going to get crazy with her. I'm not going to yell at her. I'm not going to call her names. I'm, and those are all things that inherently make someone feel unsafe. Mm-hmm. Um, but given, you know, I like to say for people who have uh, childhood wounding like yours, the people who were supposed to love you the most in the world didn't, the people who they're supposed to be the safest in the world weren't. And so the world becomes an unsafe place. And in that mm-hmm. trauma, And the fires of that trauma is forged the wounded child within. And yours is significantly unsafe in the world, or at least it it was. I don't, I don't think she is so much anymore. Um, Getting so much better. But I think (laughs) people can, even if they didn't have the kind of trauma that I did, I think Mm -hmm. uh, people can even understand often, I mean, I have a client list of people that didn't feel safe or didn't feel um, taken care of or honored by their parents Mm -hmm. or their family of Mm -hmm. origin. Um, So these questions are wide open for a lot of them. I think they come into therapy looking for answers to these questions and they don't even know it. Well, that's the thing. You don't even know it. You you don't, because you're, you're thinking it's all this topical stuff of why things aren't going right in your life. Why I can't find a person to be with, um, uh, you know, why do I push people away? Um, why, why does it never, why do I never feel like I'm enough or why, why is there not enough love? Um, those are all end up being, those all end up being symptomatic pieces. And so when I get people, whether they're individuals or couples, they come in and they start to, to, to do the deeper work when they dive down below that waterline that Sue Johnson talked about, then what we get to is, and I ask those questions early and I'll say to them, just listen and, and, and try not to think, I'll say, just feel into your body as I say these things. Am I loved? Am I safe? Am I enough? And do I matter? And I say it sort of like that. And then I'll say it again real quickly. And invariably, I'll see the waterworks start, right? Because people succumb to emotion often in the therapy room for many, many different reasons, but not the least of which is when you hit their truth button. And Absolutely. when someone finally hits that button of like, holy shit, I'm just, you see me. You see what I'm really doing here. Now, that's as a therapist. Can you imagine if your partner can look beyond the warrior self, the defender self that's doing and saying things that they're going to have to apologize for later? If they can then peer behind that warrior self and go, hi, how are you? Little girl who doesn't feel safe in the world. Right. Mm -hmm. I think I was fairly adept at that once I figured it out. Absolutely. You've, mm-hmm. you've been very adept at it. Um, it's mm-hmm. one of the things, I mean, I mean, and again, you for me safety, as well, by the way. Yeah. Safety for me is, you know, talking about things like, you know, not recreating those kind of bad fights, setting boundaries like that, um, fighting for a different reality, a different life together, um, mm-hmm. but being constant and consistent and, um, you know, acknowledging me in that way and acknowledging that you saw that and that it was important to you. So important. And I do think that, um, I, I, when I'm talking to you or even if we're in a fight, I'm trying to look for what's underneath. And one of the things I know about you is that when you're scared, you get angry. 
Mm. And knowing Mm. that has been so helpful to me because when you're, when you're angry about, you know, it could be whether we're in a fight or sometimes when the kids are sick, I can see you getting tense and I know you're scared. And that is me using my, you know, being empathic or, you know, empathetic to the fact that you're really scared underneath that fiery outside, you know, but it's easy to get tangled up in the fire because that part of me Mm -hmm does and says things that aren't awesome and, you know, probably need to be apologized for later. Um, I mean, they're not particularly, I just tend to be, I I, I tend to bark a lot. Um, (laughs) but it is, it's when I'm scared, right? Mm -hmm. When I feel the vulnerability of particular things, especially I think I've gotten better with the kids. Like I don't get, I mean, I don't get mad at them, but I would be like, Oh no, no. I just know like when, if, if they're in the other room and they're sick, you know, you're coming to me and I can feel that tension in Mm -hmm. you, Mm -hmm. um, because Mm -hmm. you're scared, Mm -hmm. you know, or like I can feel when something makes you angry, you know, just, and you know, if we're in a fight, I know you're scared underneath. That's Mm -hmm. the thing that I've come to understand. And so if I can go even farther down below, what is he afraid of? Mm -hmm. You know, then I can have compassion for you because I know underneath there is a boy who, was abandoned. I know mm-hmm. you had your own abuse as a kid. Um, there's stuff going on there and mm-hmm. it's not my job to speak for you, but I can hold a softer place for you because I know you have these questions that you're answering as well. Right. I think the other, the other question for me beyond safety, and that was, that was also news to me that like, man, I got a couple of them. I thought I only had like one, um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, that I matter. Um, yeah. That was, you know, from, from, that was from childhood wounding as well, but that, that I matter in the world. Um, if I don't feel like I matter, then my protector parts come out and they, Mm -hmm. they fight for keeps Mm -hmm. and they fight to make sure that that kid is not going to be marginalized anymore. Mm -hmm. Um, and that aspect in me is a knuckle dragging ape and, Mm -hmm. you know, he fights for space and can blow people back. Um, I remember in the dog park in New York, you were like, you're the only person who can suck the energy out of a dog park and we are outside. Mm -hmm. And it was true because if I felt like people weren't, you know, minding their animals and that I didn't matter and my dog doesn't matter, then I would make sure that I felt like I mattered. And that's Mm -hmm. what, that's what I was fighting for. Um, but you've always, you've always been able to kind of, and this is, this is also, we should probably say this. It's not that anyone else is supposed to heal your stuff, right? Like I'm not healing your stuff. I simply hold Mm -hmm. space for you to do that healing on your own. And I don't create Mm -hmm. more wounding by constantly scaring the crap out of you and making you feel unsafe in the world. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, that's so important because, right. I'm not healing you, but Mm -hmm. our relationship is a culture and an environment. Like I like to think of it, we're creating an environment together Mm -hmm. and I want this environment to feel safe to you. You know, like I don't want to mindlessly, you know, say or do anything that's going to trigger those old wounds. I mean, it's just unnecessary suffering. I think it's important to be very thoughtful, to be very kind, um, compassionate when you know someone's struggled, but also I just would never want to treat you like that anyway. Even if these weren't your wounds, I would never just want to be careless with you. I just, um, I just, so, uh, oh, go ahead. I just had a thought that you, you, you triggered a thought in me and I don't want to lose the, the thread, but like if I'm busy fighting for myself in our relationship to know that I'm safe and to know that I matter, I don't have time to heal. No. Right. Like, I'm not, I'm in in all that. I'm again, not asking you to heal me, but if I'm constantly having to fight for that ground of, I need to know that I'm safe and God damn it. I need to know that I matter. There's no time for me to pull back and ask those questions of of like, do I matter? Am I safe here? If I, if I don't feel that way with you, then I'm still fighting and still in that, in that wounded self in my protector parts. Yeah. You're still recreating your childhood in ways you're in an environment with participating in relationships that just continue to trigger those wounds. And, you know, I think relationships, whether they're friendships, Mm -hmm. whether they're a therapist relationship, whether it's a Mm -hmm. partnership, Mm -hmm. you know, having children, I think these are opportunities for us to heal. Like you're saying, they're opportunity these for us as, as the therapist or the partner to create an environment, not like, I have to create this environment so they feel safe. 
but to just do loving, mindful things that create mm-hmm. a loving environment so that we can all heal together, that we can be the best version of ourselves. That's right. You know, and with, that's- with my clients too, like I want to create an environment that's for healing as your partner. I want you to be able to do deep dives um, because you feel safe enough in this relationship. You're not worried about me mm-hmm. um, leaving you or threatening you or saying shitty things to you. You don't have to be on guard. That's right. That's and that it. means that's you exactly can be right. vulnerable and you can also receive love. I think that's a great point. But it also dovetails on that old sort of therapeutic model that you never want to do your client's work for them, right? You never want right. to take their autonomy. You never want to do for the client the thing that they can do for themselves. Mm-hmm. And I think that as as partners, as friends, as people, we see struggling, holding, we call it holding space. And a lot of people are like, what does that mean? It means knowing that your partner and you have everything inside of you to heal yourself, um, yes. but to be mindful enough by not, by not causing any more wounds in you, by, by recognizing that, wow, there's a part of you in there, Ash, that, um, doesn't feel safe. That feels like the world is often an unsafe place doing the best I can to make sure that that's that, that, that your world feels safe, that I'm a safe person, um, that I'm a safe port, so to speak. Um, that just offers you that opportunity to do the work that you're capable of doing on your own. Yeah, it's a beautiful thing. I know that my house is safe. I know my relationship is safe. Those are important things. We need to be able to feel that way. Um, And I don't hear that happening as mindfully or as consciously. You know, I think we're, there's a difference between like enabling, there's a difference between doing the work for them and being a supportive partner saying, I want you to be the best version of yourself. You do that, but let me provide this safe space for you to do that. But, and part of what you're saying um, made me push pause for a moment because I think, and I've, and I've been known to say this a lot, and I repeat myself a lot now, especially in all these podcasts and interviews and things for the book. But, um, and I always say that, you know, Hartle Hendricks said it best when he said, we are inexplicably drawn into the arms of a romantic partner who will, by their very nature, recreate our childhood wounding. And I think a lot of people stop there, right? Because that initial like collide makes them go, oh, this is obviously not meant to be, or they, and, or, and, or they get mired in the fight or they end up in a, a love embargo um, or some version of that where the fighting just kind of continues. Nothing ever really gets healed. Nothing ever gets fixed because they forget that Hendrix actually finished that quote. He said, we do this for a very good reason so that we might have a healing experience. Yes. So what is that? That's the whole experience? point. That's the whole point. Right. And so we, well, and I, we also go ahead. go ahead. No, go. No, you go. Ahead. I was just going to say that they, they stop at the hurt and they don't stay for the healing. They don't mm-hmm. No, And I think we give up too quickly when it hurts. Um, obviously if it's um, a harmful relationship, if it's abusive, that kind of thing. But when things get tough, we shut down too quickly and too easily. And I think this also can happen in friendships. I was thinking about when we were talking about environments, I have a friend who's always had to be the strongest person in the room. Um, any gifts that were given her were given with strings. Um, so, you know, I don't, I'm not going to, I'm not doing her work for her, but it's very important for me to be a constant and consistent person in her life that she knows that I could give her something or bring her something. And there's no strings attached that, that if she needs a person to talk to that I will show up and listen to her and she can not fall apart, but have her feelings or maybe fall apart. And I can hold space for her because she's never had it. And that's important to me as her friend because she doesn't have a lot of those relationships in her life. And, you know, I appreciate the same from her when she sees me in that friendship and she Mm -hmm. provides that safety as well. So it's like that you're in that you're making her not only feel loved, you're making her feel understood. Yeah. Mm, Sorry, I interrupted. No, which is such an important part of, you know, when you understand someone, when you fully see someone, how, how good it feels. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When you take the time to consider like, oh, what is this person's story? You know, how do I show up for them? And, and that's a powerful thing. I think that's right. Um, I'm wondering if we shouldn't move on to some, some of the practices that we offer in the book to help people with better fighting, better fighting skills. 
Yes. I was wondering, do you want to talk about my no? Because I think a lot of people could relate to it <laughs> as far as I think it's an important yeah. thing. Okay. Let's talk about your no. Let's do my it. energetic, <laughs> excuse me, my energetic no. I love that you're calling um, yourself out on the carpet. I am totally calling myself out. <laughs> um, so I was wondering if we should talk about it from your perspective, but basically I'll, I'll just say this. You might find in your friendships or relationships that anything you ask of someone, they say no. Um, first. Or first. Um, you might say, maybe we should do this. No, I don't really want to. Or um, <laughs> what you could do or what you might need to do. And they're like, no, no, no. Hmm. Um, often this comes from when someone has grown up in an environment where they've been shamed or overpowered by an overbearing parent, never allowed to really have choice, never really hmm. allowed to say no. Um, so the person often grows up and ends up saying no to even things that are good for them, um, because it's power, it's empowering to say no, no is such a powerful word. And if you've never been allowed to say it, it feels so good to just be like, no, with you get two words out of your mouth. No, not for me. So, well, when the most powerful person, when the most powerful person in your life, a parent constantly steals your autonomy, Mm -hmm. then the natural human need is to create some kind of space. And so your point's well made that you will even mm-hmm. say no to good things or they can people who grow up like mm-hmm. this. Yeah. Yeah. And that certainly happened yeah. for you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so, um, and it's come up in our relationship. It's better, but what is your, what was your experience of it? Cause I think there are people, I mean, we hear this a lot. I have couples in my practice where they have a no, they defeat their partner in every situation. I don't think you're that. I don't think you do that. No, I but th- I have a no. You do have a, you do have a sizable no, and we've talked about it. Like you don't like being told what to do. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, I don't know that anybody does, but like you, you have a re- very, re- you have a rebellious streak. And I've had to, t- to say to you in the past, like, I'm not the enemy. Um, this is actually a good thing for us. And so yeah. we'll see things that you, you'll say no to things. Like if it, I'm trying to think of, you know, specific examples right now, I'm drawing a blank, but throughout our time together, Get a our van. 20- no, you're like, you're a van guy. <laughs> when did you become? Cause I got a van. I think we should get a surf van. <laughs> well, right now who drives the van all the time. I drive the you van do. all the time. I didn't understand what the van would look like. I said, no. Um, yeah, I can be a little close minded at times when it comes to new stuff, but I think what you've learned say you would come with me with a new idea. You said, maybe we, we should. And as soon as yeah. I hear should, or you need, and as soon as I hear need, I shut down. And it's not because I don't value what you're going to say. It's like this physical trigger coming from my childhood of absolutely not. I'm going to keep my power, my control, my autonomy. And you've learned to say, please don't say no. Just think about what I'm going to say. And it's been really helpful. Right. So I'm bringing this right. up because I know couples whose partner says no or defeats them around every corner. No, that's not true. No, that's not right. No, I don't want to do that. And the person just feels like they're in a room with no windows and no doors. There's no opportunity for growth. There's no opportunity for healing. There's no change because this is the Mm -hmm. way things are. And I bring this up because I think it's important to understand that that person is probably saying no because it's a place of power. So how would you Mm -hmm. say that someone could navigate that? Well, first of all, you know, you bring it out into the light and talk about it and say, mm-hmm. you know, this has been my experience. And they'll probably say, no, uh, that's not the case. <laughs> but <laughs> right? you say, no, that's, that's actually, this has been my experience. And that it feels to me that when I bring anything to you directly, um, I can't do that. Right. It's an immediately shut. It's immediate shutdown. So I find myself doing these end arounds. Or you'll find yourself trying to make it out, like I have this all the time. We'll be like, well, I have to make it out like it's their idea. And like, who mm-hmm. wants to do that dog and pony show? I should be able mm-hmm. to bring good and bad ideas. I like our relationship is like the great marketplace of ideas. Some of them have been amazing, like a surf van. Um, others have been not great. Like when I suggested that we move to Washington. <laughs> Washington, D.C. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Having lived in Terrible New York idea. city, it was like, okay, it was not a great idea. Yeah. Let's um, move to Washington <clears throat> DC. No, <laughs> no, that was a fair no, but you know, there have been other things in our lives that, you know, quite frankly, like 
around money, growing up around money and trying to mm. navigate our financial situation. Um, for various reasons, there's been kind of a block in that. And so it's only been in recent years that, that that block has been sort of lifted. But I think it's because we've had conversations where I've been able to say, you say no a lot energetically and verbally um, where you push back because well, for, for various reasons. Um, but by bringing that out into the light and saying, we, I need to be able to bring you ideas and not have them shot down, shot down. And you're like, that's fair. Totally fair. And I, and you have great ideas and I want to grow in what I want to heal. And often and I, have a lot of them. I say, no, you have a lot of ideas and they're amazing. <laughs> they're, <laughs> from Washington. Not, they're not all great. They're not all no. great, but I have a lot of them. <laughs> but the other reason is, um, the reason I say no, which I totally lost my train of thought, but I, uh, anyway, I can't remember what I was going to say, but sorry, if you I have a partner, no, no, it's okay. If you have a partner where you feel defeated, this is also an important mm -hmm. point. People That's who it. say no, they, it's this powering of defeating the other person and they often can't feel their anger. So what you might notice is you end up wanting to exploding, but that's actually your partner's anger. The partner's, mm -hmm. that's the partner's anger that can't actually express because all they can say is no, 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 and defeat you. And it's just a really good dynamic to notice that, okay, there's something you can do about it here. I think it's more common than we realize. And um, that if you can bring it to their attention gently, you know, like saying, you may not agree and please understand I'm coming from this with a place of love, but it feels like I feel defeated around everything. I mean, or I feel defeated well, around a lot of things and conversations, not everything. That and that's work. right. And, and, I, and I think this type of behavior can bring up a, f a sense of feeling trapped and a lot of resentment. Mm -hmm. And it's also something that mm -hmm. fuels some pretty nasty fights it, it, that I've seen in the couples that come mm -hmm. into my practice. Um, but in the interest of time, I think we should talk about how to fight better. And, yes. um, you know, I go no further than the five practices that we offer in the book. Um, the practice of mindfulness, looking at the parts of you that show up, the story that you're telling about your partner, choosing your partner and personal responsibility. Um, if it's okay, I'm just going to run through them quickly. If you want to stop me or talk yeah. about any one of one of them. Okay. So we've all heard about mindfulness, you know, this, this idea of, you know, paying attention to your thoughts and feelings on purpose. Well, how does that help us fight better? Well, for me, when we practice mindfulness in our relationships, <clears throat> whatever kind of relationship it is, we get ourselves out of our knee jerk reactions. And that's one of the things that fuels a lot of fights with couples, right? That's, that's where you find defensiveness. That's where you find contempt and criticism. Um, that's where you'll find, um, the violent leave. You'll find volatile arguments when you are in knee jerk response. You have a thought, you have a feeling and boom, you fire off. Mindfulness allows us to take a mindful breath, to titrate the nervous system, to ease ourselves, to feel our feet on the ground and notice what we're thinking and feeling, but not reacting from that place. And so when we practice mindfulness, as it's explained in the book, um, we can practice to love our partners better. Um, when we are more mindful, we can also look at the part of us that's showing up. And this is a big piece when it comes to good communication. This is a big piece when it comes to fighting well, because we are not the single organisms we see staring back at us in the mirror. We have many, many aspects of self that live within, um, us. And when we feel triggered, when that wounded child is, is bumped into, when we don't feel loved, when we don't feel safe, when we don't feel enough, when we don't feel like we matter, guess who shows up? It's that protective part of self. And it's like, if you're trying to connect with your partner while you're in this part, it's like being in the wrong app on your phone, right? You need to be able to change out of that. In the book, we talk about how you can do that. But suffice to say, if you are in your protective aspect of self or in your wounded child, you are not going to fight well, right? And what's more is if you spend a lot of time with these sort of simmering fights and you start feeding this narrative, this is practice three, you have to look at the story you're telling and you have to ask the question, is this fair? Is this a loving narrative? Is it compassionate? Is it empathetic? Is it understanding? And very often when I have people, including myself, run through these pieces, um, 
I'm like, no, this isn't fair. This narrative that I'm telling about her is not compassionate. It's not empathetic. It's not even totally true. But if I don't ask that question from that mindful place, I will steep myself in a narrative about you that Mm -hmm. creates a reaction and creates discord. Right. Can Um, I say something about narrative? Yeah, please, please. Mm -hmm. One of the things that really helps me in the narrative is the idea of generous assumption. I think that phrase Ah, or term was coined by Brene Brown Mm -hmm. and I really love it. Um, Mm -hmm. And it reminds me of something you said to me years and years ago, which I might've already said before, but you said, when do I stop paying for what those assholes did to you? And when do you start (laughs) seeing me for me? And that was an important moment to really recognize, you know, it was a true statement. Um, It was important for me to recognize how constant you've been, right? That you're this consistent, constant person. You're compassionate. You're gentle with me. You're very honest and very direct. Um, But you, you operate from a place of love with me. So generous assumption is when you start to create a narrative that's like, oh, he's doing this to hurt me or, you know, I'm just trying to think of a narrative I would create about you. You know, he's being selfish or this or that. Um, I remind myself generous assumption allows me to assume the best of you, assume that you were doing the best you could in that moment, because for most of our relationship, you've been doing the best you could. You know, it doesn't mean there weren't mistakes and there weren't things that you've done to hurt me or anything like that, but you, we also have reparative moments. So <laughs> I just love generous assumption because it helps shift that narrative, especially if you've been in a relationship where you know this person and their intentions for most of the time are really good towards you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I, I think it's an amazing point you bring up and I will say this, and we talked about this in our, in the, in the last uh, single on purpose podcast we did, which was that. When you have significant trauma, one of the things you have a really difficult time getting to is generous assumption, right? Mm. Um, because the, the, the pain of your wounding is so, so significant and you did not feel safe. You you did not feel like you mattered. Uh, maybe you didn't feel like you were loved. It's very hard to assume generosity, to assume that, Mm -hmm. that your, your partner is acting benevolently in your direction. Um, that is something that people should be aware of that if you're having really difficult fights and you can't seem to get out of it. And you know, when you, when cooler heads prevail, you can look at your partner and go, well, they do actually show up and they are a pretty good person. Um, but when we're in it, I can't really see anything other than red. It, it, it may be due to the fact that you have some significant childhood wounding. And I think that's what we experienced at large with you early on in our relationship. It was hard for you to see through the and, and me too, um, through the haze of, of that triggering and, and, and that trauma to, to get to justice. And, and for something. anyone, exactly. And for anyone who's been in an abusive relationship as an adult, I think, right. um, any sort of conversation or criticism, um, fight that can feel so dangerous to that person's body because of in other relationships, they've led down paths that have been dangerous. Um, mm-hmm. so what you say is really important. And so that, that, that takes us from mindfulness to the parts that show up in a fight and the stories that we tell that can, that can be sort of the, uh, gas on the fire, so to speak, and generous assumption and looking at the, not just the, the, how your partner's showing up, looking at the woundedness that's in them and, and the wounded, the, the wounded aspect, the, those four questions that we talked about earlier in the podcast, and I keep bringing them up. Am I loved? Am I safe? Am I enough? And do I matter? Being able to see your partner as that uh, wounded aspect is really at the heart of the practice of choosing them, right? And um, when you can peer beyond the protective measures that, that that might be in front of you and recognize what your partner is fighting for, and it's what we did very early on, and I think in our relationship, and I think it's what is what you said earlier, it built the culture of our of our relationship, and it built the culture of how we engage when we are when we were fighting, cause we do fight. Um, and I think I was, we were talking the other day that, uh, we fought in front of the kids, which we don't tend to do. Um, but we did that and the kids really didn't have much to say about it. And I finally said to, to my, our oldest, I said, Jake, you know, are, uh, are you guys okay? And he said, yeah, why? And I said, well, mom and I were fighting in front of you guys. He goes, yeah, you always end up laughing at the end of a fight anyway. So it's not a big deal. And that's kind of the, their experience of our fights, right? 
that we end up. Yeah, kind they of just in this really, they might be fired in, in a more connected place. Mm-hmm. They might be for a yeah. minute, but we end up coming back together because of this practice, and it brings us to the to the to the fifth practice, and I think it might be the most important one for me, and that's personal responsibility. And maybe you have a few mm-hmm. things you want to say about personal responsibility. <laughs> um, <laughs> I know that I find personal responsibility incredibly sexy. It is so sexy. I, I just yeah. feel like if someone takes responsibility for the way they have hurt your feelings or hurt you mm-hmm. or for what they've done mm-hmm. or something they forgot or whatever it is, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. it is like a breath of fresh air. And like you say, it's a panty it just dropper. boils down to owning your shit. Yeah. It's a, yes. <laughs> it's a panty dropper. That's right. Well, it's, and it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's not, anyone's first go-to most of the time. And I like to say it's the last practice because if it was the first one, no one would buy the book or come or, or come to my, my, um, my practice because no one likes really, no one likes personal responsibility. It's a, it holds a space with blame and shame. And so owning your shit and also tends to, and this, this is the thing that really fuel, fuels a lot of fights, personal responsibility and owning that I hurt your feelings when my intentions were anything but that, that's really hard, right? When you say you didn't said this thing and I was like, well, that's not what I meant. That's not how I meant it. That's not, you know, I'm a, I'm a good person. I would never do that. I love you, right? I would never do that. It's really hard to then look at you and go, well, you're having a feeling and I should probably speak to that less than speak to my, my intentions. Uh, we can talk about my intentions later. And this is the really difficult one for most people to stop, push pause, to mindfully take that breath and go, okay, put, put the, put the defender aside and to say, Hey, not, and by the way, not, I'm sorry that you feel that way. That's not a thing. <laughs> we don't do that. That's such no. bullshit. Fucking hate that one. No, th- what we're talking about is saying, honestly, like, I see that I have hurt your feelings and my good intentions aside. I have done or said something that has hurt your feelings. And so for that, I'm going to, to empathy, empathy, compassion, understanding would say, I am so sorry that anything I did hurt, that, what, that thing that I did or said hurt your feelings. That We can talk about my intentions in a minute, but are you okay? Mm-hmm. And this is when the cyclical fighting stops. And this is when mm-hmm. um, validation happens, right? And this is when people yes. begin to peer beyond yeah. the veil of personal responsibility. And you see the freedom that's there. It's, 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 it's the height of emotional intelligence. It's taking, it's not losing ground. It's taking the higher ground. I know I've, I've talked a lot. No, it Sorry. softens <clears throat> everything. No, it just softens it the moment when a person just <clears throat> finally stops going into the details and telling the story and they just say, wow, I could see why you felt lonely there. Or I could see why you <clears throat> felt hurt. Or I could, you know, when <clears throat> you just have that empathy, you know, oh, right. I can empathize with you. And then the person can go, okay, thank you. Now I can take a breath. You can take a breath and we can continue the conversation, but it does deescalate. It changes the whole dynamic. And so those practices that, that really do um, deescalate the fights and make not only that, like I find that our fights are actually those moments, those difficult moments that, that were formerly polarizing when you use these mm-hmm. practices actually bring us and brought us closer together. Yeah. Right. Because when you really dive beneath the surface of what you're fighting about and you really get to the, what's underneath, you will learn to understand your partner in a way because you're not constantly fighting the thing that they're saying. You're trying to understand what they're, what they're trying to convey. Mm-hmm. And so you get to know them on a deeper level. And I think people feel more intimately connected to when you're able to do this, as strange as that may sound. That's why I don't think, I think, not fighting is not healthy uh, for many reasons, but not the least. It's just this you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if I know that underneath whatever's going on, you're hurt, you know, it doesn't excuse Mm -hmm. whatever's going on, but I know that if you bring something to me and we kind of, if we get into it underneath, we're both feeling hurt. We're both either feeling misunderstood or there's a need button, a need not being met. And when I say need, like maybe it's connection or, um, you know, connection, conversation, um, time, um, physical touch, whatever it is, you know, um, but there's something someone's triggered or feeling hurt, feeling one of those, um, questions that we talked about. And when you get to that, it just, it's just a softer, softer way of being. And so again, don't be afraid to get into it. If you are using these practices, 
those formerly polarizing moments will actually become galvanizing moments. And I'm kind of conscious of the time. I want to see what, what your thoughts are about wrapping things up. I think that's great. I feel complete. Okay. You feel complete. Oh, wonderful. Okay, good. And we can end now. So for <laughs> uh, the single on purpose podcast, this is, this is the, the practice of love podcast um, talking about how we can fight better. My name is Lair Torrent. I am uh, author of the book, The Practice of Love, and you can find Practice of Love uh, on Amazon or wherever finer books are sold. You can also find me at the, am I, am I the holistic therapist or Lair Torrent holistic Lair therapist? Torrent That's holistic therapist. <laughs> Lair Torrent holistic therapist on uh, Instagram. Ash, where we can, where can we find you? Instagram at Ashley Torrent 29 or AshleyTorrent.com. And don't forget about yeah, the Blue Butterfly you. Effect podcast that you have oh, with Blue Butterfly Millie. Effect podcast with Millie Mur Murillo. Yes. That's right. Yes, I always put your right, name. I hate so when I do that. Okay. <laughs> you have to roll your R's Signing a little out. bit better. You've got to. All right. <laughs> Thanks. Love you. Bye. I hope that episode was helpful. Hey, listen, if you want to share your singlehood journey, if you've gone somewhere, come back. If you have revelations and wisdom, please share your story. It's going to help other people. Nothing makes us feel more connected than hearing other people's stories. So just send me the audio of your story and you could just record it directly from your phone and email it to theangrytherapist at gmail.com. Also, if you want our Single on Purpose newsletter, go to singleonpurpose.life. That's singleonpurpose.life. You will get tools and articles and other people's stories and also uh, zoom links to private gathers so if you want to join our community go to singleonpurpose.life thank you for listening be well we hope you tell a friend so i'm a divorced 54 year old single female heterosexual and i must say that your content brings me hope that i find a love that's right for me someday but it also reminds me that I don't have to be in a hurry and I do not have to settle in order to have that. What I have learned is to love me so much that it's, it's kind of difficult to have the tolerance or patience for another person in my life who's not the right fit. But I've also learned that having platonic male friendships can be just as gratifying as romantic relationships and that my friendships, my family relationships, even casual acquaintanceships enhance my sense of self-satisfaction, and I feel whole at this time in my life. At 54, I'm still open to romantic love and a lifelong companion, but in the meantime, I'm loving just learning and dating me, and I'm a fantastic freaking person. Hey, thanks for listening.